Today we're going to continue talking a little bit about three bits and then I'm going to switch to a different topic. So let's start with a problem that you all know about and this is the knapsack problem. So what's the knapsack problem? Especially I want to focus on zero one knapsack. So you have a knapsack and your knapsack has some capacity, let's say you have a knapsack of capacity C, and then you have a bunch of items. So let's say you have N items, and each item has two parameters. Each item has some weight, WI, so this is the weight of item I. And it also has some value VI. And basically, you want to take a subset of the items into your knapsack. So when you take a subset of the items, the sum of the weights of all these items should be at most C. And you want to maximize the sum of the values. This is like the classical knapsack problem. And we have only one copy of each item. So for each item, you can either take it or not. Now, I'm pretty sure you've seen how to solve this using dynamic programming before, but I'm just going to go over it because we will talk about some other ideas here as well. So let's say that I define dp of uh, i and c prime to be the maximum amount of money that I can make if I have a knapsack with capacity c prime and I can only use the first i i. I'm too lazy to write this, just for a moment. So now, how would we solve this? So the, the base cases are trivial. Like if your knapsack has size zero, of course, you can't take anything. So the answer is zero. If you don't have any items, you can't take anything. Again, the answer is zero. But basically, if I want to compute dp of i and c prime in non-trivial cases, I have to decide whether I want to take item i. Right, And if I take item i into my knapsack, then I will have a capacity of c prime minus the weight of the ice item. And now I have to fill the rest of my knapsack with the previous i minus 1 items. And of course, I also get the value of this item because I put this item into my knapsack. And the other thing I can do is to just choose not to take the ice item. And in this case, I will just have dp of i minus 1 and c prime. And since I want to maximize the whole thing, I just take the maximum of these two. OK. Now, how much time does this algorithm take? So if my capacity is c and I have n items, Basically, i goes from 1 to n, or 0 to n, and c prime also goes from 0 to c. So my total runtime is going to be O of n c. Now, is this a polynomial time algorithm? You see, when we are analyzing an algorithm, and when we said that some algorithm's runtime is in p, or some problem is in p, uh, basically, we analyze the runtime based on the length of the input. But what is the length of our input here? So in, in my input, I have two n numbers, which are the weights and values. But I just have a single number c here. And writing a number, even if you want to be very precise about it, if I want to write the number c, it takes log c bits to write it. Right? So my input size is actually something like O of n plus log c, or something like that. Right? You can be even more precise and say, OK, how many bits does any one of these numbers need? And if, if we assume that any one of these numbers also needs like the same amount of bits as c, then I can say that 
I need n times logs. OK? But here's the thing. If this is my input size, then this algorithm is not a polynomial time algorithm, because this is not a polynomial time based, a polynomial based on this. Right? You can just imagine what happens if n is a small number. Let's say n is 100, and c is just a huge number. Then your input size is just log c, but your runtime actually depends on c, which is 2 to the power of the input size. So this is actually not a polynomial time algorithm. But it would be polynomial time if we write our input in unary instead of binary. So just imagine that instead of writing this number c in binary, I would just write it in unary, which means that I put c one digits after each other so that I have a length of c really in my input. Then this algorithm would become polynomial time. So these kinds of algorithms, we will call them pseudo-polynomial. Like they're polynomial, but only if you assume the input is given to you in unit. Right? And actually, if we don't assume that, if we assume that our input is given in binary, then the problem is empty hard. Okay. Uh, so for these kinds of cases, we say that this problem is NP-hard, but it's not strongly NP-hard. So a problem is strongly NP-hard if it's NP-hard even when you give the input in unary. So for example, if you consider a problem like three sets, their writing the input in unary doesn't really change anything. So three set is NP-hard, and even if you write the input in unary, it's still NP-hard, so it's strongly NP-hard. Okay, but this is not, the main focus here, I just wanted you to see that we have an algorithm of this runtime. And yeah, if the capacity is small and uh, if the capacity is somehow a polynomial in terms of n, then we can say this whole thing is polynomial. But now I want to make the problem a little bit more interesting. And I want to add some conditions between these items that we have. So for example, I like to say that some items uh, are prerequisites of other items. So I want to say it might be the case that one item depends on another. And if you want to take this one, you have to also take the other. OK? That's one thing that I want to say. So here are my constraints. The first type of constraint that I want to define is something like this, prec uh, ij. And this basically means if you take item j, you have to take item i as well. Okay. If you take j, you must take i. OK. Maybe I want to have something uh, this is kind of like the opposite of this. So maybe I can say two items have conflict with each other. So if I say that i and j are in conflict, then this means that if you take i, you must not take j. Or, OK, if you take j, you must not take i. I don't really care which side you think this is. So if you take j, you must not OK. I can add more kinds of constraints as well, but let's just work with these two types. So let's say that my input is now a knapsack instance, and it also has some constraints. And I want to solve it like that. So I want to figure out if I can fit all the items in, like I, which subset of items can I take so that I maximize the total value of the items I take and also the total weight of the items I take fit in my knapsack's capacity. And also I satisfy all of these constraints that I was given. Okay. So this problem is actually strongly NP-hard, so it's harder than knapsack. 
and you're not going to be able to find an algorithm with runtime O and C or something like that. Uh, I'm not going to prove that it's strongly NPR, but the proof is not too hard. You can just take three sat and try to reduce it to this case. But what happens if I parameterize this? So I want to parameterize by my favorite parameter, which is three. Again, just last time, when we were solving systems of linear equations, we need to first have a graph in order to be able to even talk about three bits. And on the face of it, we don't have a graph yet. But actually, it's quite easy to get a graph, right? So just put one vertex for every one of your items and put an edge between two vertices if they have some constraint on them. So this is the same idea that we had last time. We had one vertex for every variable and then some edge between two variables if there was a constraint that touched both of them. Here, we're going to do the same. So whenever I have something like this, I'll just put an edge from i to j. And whenever I have this, I also put an edge from i to j. Now, I mean, in the implementation, you can maybe use different types of edges with two colors so that you know which one is this constraint and which one is this. But as far as the three bits is concerned, I don't care. Just put all of these edges in and then take a three decomposition of that primal graph. Okay. So this is knapsack parameterized by the three bits of the primal graph. And that's called edge. Okay. How would we solve something like this? Well, let's just take our dynamic programming idea for normal knapsack and on the other hand take our dynamic programming idea for graphs that have bounded three bits and let's just see if we can merge the two right so when we were doing normal knapsack our dynamic programming was something like this right so i was looking at different possible capacities i was looking at smaller knapsacks and I was also looking at which subset of the items I can put into my knapsack. So I was saying I can put the first I. But now just imagine what kind of dynamic programming we had when we were solving, for example, maximum independence set uh, on a 3 decomposition. So we had something like this. It was DP of some bag and some mask on that bag. Right? So now I want to define a dynamic programming that basically uh, has all the information in all of these two ideas, right? And here, my instance was actually like a smaller graph. It was the part of the graph that corresponded to the subtree of B, right? So in a sense, if I just take that smaller graph, it already tells me which items I can put in. So the information encoded here by B makes the information encoded by I unnecessary, right? But I still need the capacity. So based on this simple intuition, I'm going to define a dynamic programming. And I'm going to have a variable for every bag B, for every mask M. So M is just a subset of the vertices in B and for every capacity c prime actually it's too hard for me to just write c prime every time so let's call that capacity d okay so what is this dynamic programming variable going to be after we evaluate it well first of all i'm going to say only look at the subtree of b and the corresponding subgraph okay so this is going to be equal to the maximum sum of values of a subset of items. But this subset of items should all appear in the subtree of B, in the subgraph corresponding to the subtree of B. So in GB. Now, what other conditions should I have? 
well, of course, I want my mask M. Let's call this subset S. I say such that S intersection with the vertices that appear in the bag is exactly the mask M. And of course, I want uh, everything to fit in D, right? So I, I'm thinking of a smaller knapsack that has only size D. So the other condition is that the sum of the weights of all the elements that are in S should be at most D. So sum of WI where I is in S should be less than or equal to D. Now, this is the dynamic programming variable that I define. And now I want to somehow compute this for every B, M, and D. Okay. Now, as usual, I'm going to assume that I have a nice tree decomposition because it's just nicer to work with nice tree decompositions. Okay. So let's say I have a nice tree decomposition. And if I have a nice tree decomposition, then I have basically four types of bags. I have leaves, introduce bags, forget bags, and merge bags. So I just have to say how I compute this dynamic programming for each type of bag. OK? So first of all, let's look at leaves. OK, so if I have a leaf L, it's a bag. Then since my 3D composition is nice, I know that this leaf is empty. So V of L is just the empty space. Right? And I also know that the graph corresponding to this leaf is empty. Right? So if I have an empty graph, I basically have no items because my items were vertices of my graph. And if I have no items to put into my knapsack, well, the, t the best total that I can get is always zero, right? So if I have a leaf L, then DP of B, L, and D is always zero, no matter what B and D. Okay, leaves are usually the simplest things. Now let's go to the next case. Let's say that I have an introduced pack. So what does an introduced tag look like? Well, there is this tag B, and we have some things that are above it that are going to be in our future. And it has only one child. Let's call that C. And as we said before, B has one vertex more than C. So all the vertices that are in C also appear in B. But B has additionally one more vertex. Let's call this vertex B. OK? So now I want to compute this thing, dp of b m d. OK, how can I do that? dp. Well, m tells me exactly which subset of vertices in b are going to go into my NAPS. Which subset of items in B are going to go into my maps? Okay. So, first of all, I have to do some sanity checks, right? So, first of all, if the sum of the weights of the items in M is already larger than D, then I can't do it, right? And then I would, again, just set this DP value to minus infinity to, to show that this is impossible. Okay. So, that's the first sanity check. What else? Well, I know exactly what vertices in B I'm taking into my knapsack, right? So I can now locally check if I'm somehow missing uh, a prerequisite or a conflict. So for example, if I have two vertices in M, let's say this is in M and this one is in M as well, and they're in conflict with each other. Then again, I know that I can take this particular M because it doesn't satisfy my conflict requirements. OK, so if I can take this m, then again, I just say the answer is minus infinity. There is another case where I cannot take this m. 
And that's the case where, let's say, I'm taking some vertex and some other vertex in the same bag is a prerequisite, but I'm not taking the prerequisite. I'm only taking the other. So in that case, I would also say this answer is minus. So from now on, we do all these sanity checks every time. So I'm not going to talk about this anymore, but you should just assume that whenever I'm saying how to compute these DP variables, I first do these local checks to make sure everything is fine. And if not, I will set it to minus. OK, so assuming that everything is fine locally, I want to compute this DP. Well, again, look at the boundary graphs that we have. So we had a boundary graph here, which had C as its boundary. And then now we have a larger boundary graph that has B as its boundary. And basically, the difference is that I've added B into the boundary. Right? So the situation is very similar to the normal knapsack. It's just I have to decide whether I want to put this vertex V into my knapsack or not. Right? So either I put the vertex V in my knapsack, in which case I get DP of C. And OK, my capacity decreases by the value of this vertex. OK, I shouldn't have called it V. OK, let's call it I. OK, either I put I into my item I into my knapsack in which case the capacity of my knapsack should decrease by the weight of the item i. And of, of course, I get the value of item i uh, in my value. But what happens to my mass? Oh, sorry, what happens to my mass? So my mass tells me exactly which elements from b I should take. Right? So it also tells me exactly which elements from c I should take. My mask at C is just my mask at B minus this element I. So I will just have M minus I. And this is like a set minus. So when do I do this? I do this when I want to put vertex I into my knapsack. But I put vertex I into my knapsack only if I is in M. So this case happens only if I is in M. OK. What happens if I is not in M? So I know that I'm not going to put vertex I into my knapsack. Right? And I've already done all the checks that were necessary here. So that's fine. So now I can just say, OK, you have to fill in the knapsack with this graph with the graph that's corresponded to node C. And yeah, M doesn't change because I was not in M before. So in this case, I just get DP of C, M, and my capacity also doesn't change. Right? OK. So this is fine. As you see, we can basically do it in constant time. So now let's go to the next case, which is what happens if I have a forget not. So a forget not is basically the opposite of an introduced. I have some bad B, I have some future up there. It the bag B has exactly one child C, but now C has one vertex more than B. So I have a bunch of vertices that are in B. All of them are also in C. C has just one more vertex. Let's again call that. Okay. Now, in this case, I'm going to use the same argument that I used last time for a lot of other problems. The graph corresponding to C and the graph corresponding to B are the same. Right? Because when we are forgetting this vertex, we are only forgetting it from our boundary. It remains in our graph. So the boundary graph that I had here is basically the same as the boundary graph I have here. But now, my mask only tells me which one of these vertices 
I should put into my knapsack. It doesn't tell me anything about vertex I. But I can just try both cases. I either put I in or I don't put I in. Right? So in this case, I can simply say that BP of BMD is just the maximum of BP of C, M union with I. So I'm putting I into my knapsack and B or BP of C, M, D. So this time I'm not putting item I in my knapsack. And again, I, I didn't want to repeat this, but before doing this, I do a local check here to make sure that everything is fine in this bag. So and that I don't uh, violate any of my prerequisites and conflicts in this bag. Okay, so this is for forget. Finally, we have to solve the case of a join node. So a join bag is just a bag B, and it has two children. Let's call this one C1, and let's call this one C2. Right. And of course, there can be some future there as well. And because it's a nice 3D composition, the vertices in B are equal to the set of vertices at C1, equal to the set of vertices at C2. So if I have a bunch of vertices here, I have exactly the same vertices here and also. And now I want to compute BP of B, M, and B. Now let's see what happens here. So I used to have a boundary graph here and another boundary graph here. And now I have a much larger boundary graph that contains both of them. Okay. Now, what does DP of BMD mean? I have a knapsack that has capacity D. And I can fill this knapsack using all the elements that appear anywhere here in this larger boundary graph, right? And additionally, I have a mask M that tells me exactly which elements in B are going to be in my knapsack. So the same mask also tells me exactly which elements in C1 are going to be there and exactly which elements in C2, right? But we have a problem. The problem is, uh, well, take these two boundary graphs. Their only intersection is their boundary, which is these uh, bags, which is the same as B. Uh, but I have to decide which elements I take from the left side and which elements I take from the right side. Or in other words, I have to decide how much of my capacity D I allocate to the left side and how much of it I allocate to the right side. Okay. So I just take maximum. And let's say that I allocate the capacity of D1 to the left side, okay? So let's say I allocated D1 to the left side, but what constraints do I have on D1? So how big or how small can it be when I want to allocate some capacity to the left side? So basically the thing is, it has to at least have enough room for M. So it might, it has to be larger than the sum of all the weights in M. So I write that as W of M, but you know what I mean. I just mean sum of W for all the elements in M. Okay, how big can it get? Well, I can just give everything to C1. So between D1 and D. Okay, now, what do I get? On the left hand, I have DP of C1, M, and D1, right? Because it's just, if I didn't have this part, it would be like a forget node, kind of. 
right? So I can just say that I want to fill D1 uh, units of my capacity from the left side, and I already had a mask on B, the same mask applies on C1, so I don't have to change the mask. That's Okay, but this is what I can get from the left side. What can I get from the right side? Now, how much, if I give a capacity of D1 to the left side, how much capacity am I assigning to the right side? So it's C2 and M, that's fine. So C2 is just this bag. The mask doesn't change. I just have to figure out how much capacity I have to give it. Right? So I had D units of capacity in the beginning, and I gave D1 units to the left. So I have D minus D1 units remaining, but a very important point is that the vertices in M appear on both sides, right? So it would be not only D minus D1, but D minus D1 plus the weight of M. Right? Because another way of looking at it is that I have to put in the items of M and here I'm giving D1 minus the weight of M for all the other items that I get from this side. And so I will have D minus D1 plus the weight of M for this. Okay, and finally, again, we have to be very careful. M appears on both sides. So if I just sum these two DP values, I've summed the value of M twice. So at the end of all of this, I have to say minus the value of M, which is again the sum of the which is the sum of the values of all the items. And I have to take this maximum over all possible D1. Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's our algorithm. So what is our runtime now? So how many DP variables do I have? Let's figure that out first. So the number of DP variables is I have n different bags, right? And assuming that my three bits was k, the number of masks that I can have is just 2 to the power of k. And then this was just the capacity, so it can be from 0 to c. So there are c plus 1 different values, but let's just call it c. So this is the number of DP variables that I have. But how much time am I spending? on each dp variable when I want to compute. So remember, every dp variable starts with a sanity check. And the sanity check is actually quite easy. That's like just k squared, because I'm, I'm just checking all of the edges. But the most expensive case is this case. Here, I'm going over maybe c different values for d1, right? because I'm trying every possible capacity. So my overall runtime is just something like this. n times 2 to the power of k times c squared. OK. To be more specific, I can write this as c squared plus k squared. So I do the same shape of this. Nice. So this is FPT if you assume that c is given in unary. So in a sense, even though the problem was strongly NP-hard, when the primal graph G has bounded three bits, it's no longer strongly NP-hard, and you can find a pseudo FPT. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's C times C plus K squared. OK. So now this is an example of an algorithm that actually has a better runtime if you have bounded pass bits instead of bounded three bits. So our runtime with bounded three bits, assuming just assume that this k is a constant for a second, if I have bounded three bits, my runtime is nc squared, right? 
But what happens if I have bounded passwords? If I have bounded passwords, I basically have the same algorithm, except that in a pass decomposition, I wouldn't have a join node. Right, so this step, which was the most time consuming step, will never happen when I have bounded passwords. Right? So if I have bounded passwords, then my runtime will just be over. Well, I have n bags, I have 2 to the power of k uh, masks for every bag, I have c different capacities, and then at every one of these DPs, the most expensive thing that I'm doing is that sanity check that I talked about, which just takes k squared. So again, if you assume that k is a constant, this would be just O n times c, which is as good as the original dynamic programming algorithm for knapsack without even having any constraints. So if your pass width is bounded here, you get a much better algorithm than if your three bits is bounded. Let me now go to a different bridge. Uh, this is all I wanted to tell you about three bits, basically. And now I want to go back to the idea of color coding. We've already seen one example of it, but generally I want to talk about randomized techniques in parameterized algorithms. And one of the most important techniques is, of course, color coding. So we've already seen how color coding works when we wanted to solve the k-pass problem. So we were given a graph, and the question was, does this graph have a pass with k vertices? And the idea was basically to just randomly color every node of the graph, every vertex of the graph, with one of the k colors. And then instead of asking whether I have a pass with k vertices, I asked whether I have a pass that has k different colors. OK, so what do these colors do for us, really, in color coding? Basically, I had my whole graph. Let's say this was my whole graph G. And I would just randomly color it. Right? So I would get a bunch of different parts. Let's say k different parts. This is the part that was colored 1. This is the part that was colored 2, and this one was the part that was colored k. Right. And then instead of trying to find the pass in the whole graph, I would just say, can you find the pass that goes from 1 to 2 to 3, so on? Or another way of looking at it, which actually gave us a better runtime, was can you find the pass that has exactly one vertex in each one of these parts? So now I want to look at other problems in which we can apply a similar idea. So I want to take my graph, and I want to cut it into several different pieces. And then I want to say that my solution should take one vertex from each piece, or that my solution has different parts, and each part should come from one of these pieces. Okay. And then the whole idea of randomization is that the way that we're cutting the graph into pieces is random. So here's the first example. This is called sparse subgraph. Oh, and this is also the first example where we're using two parameters now. OK. So sparse subgraph. As the input. I just give you a graph G. Okay. And let's say that the graph is undirected, and let's say it's a simple graph. Now, I want you to find a small subset of vertices so that the number of edges that goes out from this subset is also small. OK, so I give you this graph G. And I give you two parameters, k and k prime, both in n. And the question you should answer is this. 
is there some subset of vertices? Is there some x, let's say, subset of vertices such that, first of all, x itself has at most k vertices in it. So I want to choose a small subset. And I also want to say that the number of edges that go outside of x is small. So how do I say that? Well, I can just take the edges of the form uv like this, where u is in x and v is not in x, right? And I can take the size of this set, and I want to say that this should be at most k. Okay, so another way of looking at this is that I want to find a bunch of vertices, a small number, and I don't care how many edges they have between themselves. So that's fine. But the number of edges that go out from these vertices, this number should be at most k prime. Okay. This is the problem I'm and yeah, so what are our parameters? Our parameters are k and k prime. So this is parameterized by k and k prime. Now, before I actually get into this, what does it mean when we have more than one parameter? Because I defined what FPT and XP and all of these things mean when we have just one parameter. Right? But you can imagine that if I have FPT on two parameters, then I can probably have nonlinear non-polynomial dependence on each one of these, right? But actually, the simplest way to look at it is that just assume that my parameter is the sum of these two, right? Because if my runtime is bounded by some polynomial times some function of k and some function of k prime, I can just find the function of k plus k prime. So, yeah, that's the definition when you have more than one time. Okay, now let's go back here and let's see how we can find this kind of. Thing. So let's say I'm given a huge graph, but both k and k prime are small parameters. So I want to find a really small subset of vertices, and I also want the number of edges going out of those vertices to be. Okay. Can you come up with an XP algorithm first? Like XP is super trivial. You can just try every subset that has at most k vertices. And for that subset, you can just count how many edges go out. Right? And this will give you something like n to the power of k plus 1 on n k plus 2. So it's XP. But of course, I'd rather have FPT. And I want to use this idea of color code. So the way I drew this picture, I drew the, the set X in red, and I drew everything else in blue. So let's try to just do that. Let's say I just color my whole graph with two colors, red and blue. And just to make things easy, let's say that for every vertex, I just flip a coin, and with probability half, I make it red. With probability half, I make it blue. And then the question that I ask is no longer whether such a set x exists, but whether there is an x such that all the vertices in x are red, and all the vertices in the neighborhood of x are blue. So I want all the vertices here to be blue. And I want all the vertices in my solution to be red. OK? Now, before solving this, let's just do some probabilistic analysis and see whether a randomized algorithm will work. So suppose that I have some polynomial time algorithm that gets a graph that is already colored with two colors and tells me whether I have a set of red vertices of size at most k that are only neighbors with blue vertices outside of themselves, and the number of those blue vertices is that most k prime. 
Okay, so let's just assume that I have an algorithm for that. So how would I use my color coding? Well, of course, I just do a random coloring. But if I do a random coloring, what is the probability that I would be successful, assuming that a solution exists? So my worst case would be if the solution is unique, right? So assuming that there is just one solution, just this solution, what is the probability that I color the graph in a way that I can find this solution? Well, I have to color all of these vertices in the solution, and I have to color them red. And I have at most k vertices in my solution. So the probability that each one of them is colored red is 1 over 2. So the total probability is 1 over 2 to the power of 2. Right? But this is just the probability that I color these guys red. I have to color all of these neighbors blue. And I know that the number of neighbors is at most k prime. And again, for each one of the neighbors, the probability that it's colored blue is just 1 over 2. So my overall probability is just this. 1 over 2 to the power of k plus k prime. So if I do a random coloring, this is my probability of success. So what does this tell me? It tells me that if I do a random coloring and this is my probability of success, then I have to basically repeat my algorithm 2 to the power of k plus k prime times in order to have an algorithm that has constant probability of success. Okay? So I already know how many times I have to do my coloring. But now let's fill in the other part. Let's say that I've already given you the coloring. So now instead of just having a graph, your graph has two parts. There is the red part and there is the blue part. Right? And you want to find a subset of the red part such that all of its neighbors are in the blue part and the size of the subset itself is at most k and the number of neighbors in the blue part is at most k. Okay, so here's the first point I would look at. Let's just look at the connected components of each side. Okay, so let's say that, for example, here, I have a bunch of red vertices. And let's say there are two connected components. Okay. Can I just take part of a connected component into my solution? Can I, for example, take this vertex in, into my solution, but not this? No, because we said that everything in our solution should be red, and every neighbor that is not in the solution has to be blue. So if I take this vertex, and it has a red neighbor, then I have to also take the red neighbor into my solution, because I can only have blue neighbors that are not in my solution. So in other words, the choice that I have here is just to choose which subset of the connected components I want to take into my solution. Right? Which connected components of R do I want to take into my solution? OK. Now, let's look at these neighbors. And OK, now actually, I want to say something. Uh, the number of these neighbors is not going to be exactly k prime, right? Because this k prime was supposed to be a bound on the number of edges that go out. So I might have a weird case like this. I might have a blue vertex that is connected to two of the red vertices in my solution. And then I would count the edges, so this counts as two. It doesn't count as just one. OK. So anyway, I want to choose a subset of the connected components of R. But for each connected component, I know how many edges it has to the blue side. Right? And the total number of edges that go from the red side to the blue side should be at most k prime. And of course, uh, the total number of vertices that I take 
should be at most 10. So does this ring a bell? It's like the same problem that we solved before. This is basically knapsack. So I just take every connected component of R. Let's say I take connected components number I. And I have to give it a weight, and I have to give it a value. Its weight is just going to be the number of vertices in it. So here, for example, the weight of this one is just 3. The weight of this one is 4. OK? And what about its value? Its value is the number of edges that go out of it. So value of i would be uh, too hard to write. Okay. The number of edges that go out of connected component i. So now what do I want to do? I want to choose a subset of these items, a subset of my connected components, such that the sum of their weights is at most k, and the sum of their value is at most k prime. OK? It's a bit weird in the sense that I want to also have smaller value. I don't want to have large value here. But it's basically knapsack, and the same dynamic programming works. So. But the funny thing is that the capacity of my knapsack is just n. Right? And actually, no, even less than that, right? So uh, yeah, the capacity of my knapsack is k. So the capacity is at most k. Every weight is at most k. Because if I have a connected component that has more than k vertices, I just know that I can't take that one. I just ignore it. And yes, because if you take even one vertex of a connected component, then you have to take all of its red neighbors. And then you just continue this, and then you have to take the entire red connected components. OK. Yeah, so you can just solve this in k squared time, right? Because. Uh, or actually, let me see, in nk time? In nk time. So how many connected components can I have? At most n, right? And the capacity of my knapsack is just k. So I can solve this in nk time. And of course, I also needed like a DFS at the beginning to figure out like, what are the connected components and so on. But all of it is just linear, assuming that k is a small constant. So, yeah, my runtime for this whole thing is just nk plus n plus m. This was for my uh, BFS that just found the connected components here. And as we talked about this before, in order to have a constant probability of success, I have to just run this thing 2 to the power of k plus k prime times. This is the number of different random colorings that I have. So this is my overall one. And of course, it's a and that's perfect. OK. So let's see another example. So this example is called QK cuts. Okay. It's going to be bound first by Q. Okay. So the problem is I give you some graph G again, as usual. So my input is just a graph G. And I also give you two parameters, q and k. Now, I want you to, again, remove k vertices. But I want these k vertices to be a cut. So I want you to find k vertices so that when we remove them from the graph, the graph breaks into at least two connected components. OK, but that's not all. So the question is is there some subset x of the vertices 
such that the number of vertices in X is at most K, and X is a cut. But here's the thing, for a lot of algorithms, for example, when I'm doing, let's say, any kind of divide and conquer algorithm, I'd rather really find cuts that don't break my graph into uh, a lot of small uh, connected components. So I want to make sure that I have some connected component that is large enough when I do the cut. Or more specifically, I want two connected components such that each one of them has at least Q vertices. So is there a subset of vertices of size at most k that I can remove? And after removing it, I have at least two connected components. with. Uh, each of them with uh, more than Q vertices. Okay. So the way I want you to look at this is that I have some cuts and the number of vertices in the cut is at most K. And when I remove these vertices, my graph breaks down into a bunch of connected components. So let's say these are my connected components after I remove these K vertices. And I want at least two of these connected components to be non-trivial and be big enough. And big enough is defined by another parameter Q. So I want at least one connected component here to be Q vertices and one connected component here. Okay? And again, my parameters are Q and K, both of them. And just like the previous case, it's actually trivial to find an XP algorithm. So you can just try any subset of vertices of size at most K, just remove them and just count the size of all the remaining connected components. And just see if you have two connected components, each with at least Q vertices. Okay. How do we do color coding here? Again, I've already given you the answer, so we color it with two colors. And ideally, what I want to have after my coloring is that I want the vertices in my cut to be colored red. But I don't want to say that I want all the other vertices to be black, because that would make it really hard, right? Uh, if I say I want all the vertices in my cut to be red and every other vertex to be black, I'm basically fixing a single uh, coloring. And if I have only a single coloring, then the probability that the whole thing works is really low. It's just 1 over 2 to the power of n. So I have to be more careful about that. I want to say that I color it with two colors. Now let's say instead of black, I use blue this time. So I... I use red and blue, and I want my cut to be colored red, and I want there to be some connected part after I remove this cut that is blue and has at least Q uh, vertices. So this doesn't have to be the whole connected component, right? Because my whole connected component might be really large. I just say that I want a connected part of the graph, which is not necessarily a connected component, that is colored blue and has at least Q vertices. And of course, I want two of these. And of course, I want these two to be in different connected components. OK? Now, if I have this concept of coloring in mind, and let's say that Again, I just assume I have an algorithm that, given a graph that is colored with two colors, red and blue, tells me whether there are two sets like this. Tells me, well, actually, three sets. I need the cut itself. Suppose that I have an algorithm that, given a graph, 
whose vertices are colored either red or blue, tells me whether there is a cut only consisting of red vertices that has size at most k, such that when I remove it, there are two connected uh, parts, let's say, that are both blue and both have more than q elements, and also they're not connected to each other. Okay, so let's say I have an algorithm for that mouse code. Now, how many different random colorings should I try before that algorithm works with constant probability? So, or other way of looking at it, I just use a random coloring. What is the probability that all of these things are present? So, again, I have k vertices here that should all be colored red. The probability of that is just 1 over 2 to the power of k. And then I have q vertices here and q vertices here that should be colored blue. And again, the probability for every vertex is a half. So my total probability of success is 1 over 2 to the power of k plus 2q. Right? So this also tells me that if I just use a random coloring, and if I have an algorithm for the rest of it, then I have to repeat that random coloring generation and the algorithm 2 to the power of k plus 2q times before I get uh, constant probability of things. So my total runtime here is going to be 2 to the power of k plus 2q times whatever comes next. OK. So now again, I want you to look at the same picture that I had last time. So I have colored my graph with two colors. I have a red part, and I have a blue. Right. Now, what do I want? I want to choose at most k vertices from the red part. Right. So that when I remove them, there are two connected components in the blue part that each have more than q elements. Okay, so now, instead of uh, looking at the connected components of the red part, let's just look at the connected components of the blue. Let's say each one of these is a connected component in the blue part. Okay. So if I remove a bunch of red vertices, these connected components remain connected, right? Because they were all on the blue side and only had blue edges between them. So yeah, removing red vertices doesn't really change it. Uh, so what do I want to do? I want to take two of these connected components on the blue side and say that they are these parts of my solution, the parts that had size greater than or equal to Q. So I have to find two connected components of the blue side that each have more than Q elements, more than Q vertices in them. And I might have a lot of choices for that. But let's say I take one of those choices. So let's say this one has at least Q vertices and this one has at least Q vertices. And so I want these two to be separated when I remove some red vertices. Okay. Of course, the problem is that there might be some connections, right? So these red vertices, there might be a red vertex that is connected to all of them. There might be some further connections in the red part. But yeah, they're not connected in the blue part, but they can be really well connected using the red part. And I just want to remove at most k vertices from the red part to make these two disconnect. Okay. How many vertices do I need to remove from the red part? This is actually quite an easy problem. So I just want to find the minimum cut between these two sets. Right? And from undergraduate courses, I expect that you know you can use you can compute minimum cuts using max flow algorithms. So that's polynomial that. So for any two of the connected components on the blue side, I can just write a, a 
I can just run a max flow algorithm, and in polynomial time, I can figure out how many vertices I should remove in order to make these two parts disconnect. Okay? Now, the vertices that I remove, are they going to be on the blue side? Or are they only going to be on the red side? It might be that in my optimal solution, I have to actually remove some vertices from the blue side, right? Because maybe this is this component is very well connected to the to some component in red, which is very well connected to this one, which is again very well connected to another component there, and finally this one. And then it might be optimal to actually remove this one. But if that happens, I just change my coloring. Just anything that you remove, put it in red. Right? So if I find something like that, so if I take two of these connected components and I find the min cut between them, and I see that that min cut has at most k vertices. That's already a solution, right? That mean cut is k vertices. And if I remove it, these two parts become disconnected, and each of them have at least q vertices. That's a solution. I'm happy with that. OK? But now let's look at it the other way around. Suppose that a solution exists where I'm only removing red vertices. So suppose that it's possible to remove k red vertices so that these two connected components become disconnected, right? So in that case, again, the, uh, the mean cut between these two is going to have size at most k. So in any case, my answer is yes, if and only if the mean cut between two of these connected components has size at most k. And of course, I have to also uh, consider, yeah, no, I don't have to consider anything else. Yeah, that's fine. And if the mean cut had some vertex here, I just push that vertex to the others. OK. So how much time does this take? Well, I have to first find the connected components. That's a DFS. It's n plus n. Right? And then I have to uh, basically uh, look at every pair of connected components on this side that have a size of at least q. So I can have n over q such connected components at most. So this is plus n over q, and both of it, all of it could be squared, because I'm taking a pair. And this whole thing should be multiplied by the runtime of whatever algorithm you use for finding mean cuts or max flow. So times max flows runtime. And depending on what algorithm you use, you will have a different runtime here, but it will be polynomial. Okay? So this part is polynomial. This part is polynomial. I mean, instead of n over q squared, I could just write n squared, right? And this is the only non polynomial part, but it only depends on the parameters. And it's just multiplied. So it's just the constants that is getting multiplied. So the whole thing is FPT. Okay. Now, I don't have enough time to go to the next topic, uh, but I can give you some refresher on algebra, which is what we will need for the next topic. And then I will actually teach the next topic next session. So continuing with this theme of using both parametrization and randomization, one family of techniques that we use a lot actually are called algebraic techniques. Um, so let me just ask you, how many of you have taken an algebra course? It's like groups and rings and fields and things like that. Okay. Two, three, four. Okay, not too bad. So you guys can probably help others if they don't really understand this work. Okay. 
Uh, but actually, you don't need to know too much algebra. So I'm just going to give you almost everything that you need. And we're going to actually use fields. So what is a field? So a field is just some set. Let's call it F. So set F. And I also have two operations on this set F. I have addition and I have multiplication. And I write them like this because they're not the normal addition or multiplication. They can be any operation, right? And I also have a zero element and a one element. Now, it would be a field if these operations and these elements satisfy a bunch of constraints. And I always forget some of them, so now I have notes. Uh, the first is that everything should be associative. So what's associativity? Well, basically, you can add and you can multiply in any order. So A plus B, all of it plus C is the same as A plus C plus C. Okay. And I have the same thing for multiplication. So just like normal algebra, I'm too lazy to write the uh, multiplication symbol. So when I write AD, it just means A multiplied. So AD times C is the same as A times C times C. OK, this is associativity. Then I need it to also be commutative. which basically means A plus B is the same as B plus A, and A times B, or just AB, is the same as B times B. Okay, and this holds for any element of my sheet. So all of these things have to hold for any A, B, and C that are in the set. Okay, then I need the distributed property which basically says that a times b plus c is just a times b plus a times c and yeah there's more we should have identity properties so we have zero and one and what are our identity properties? It's just that if you add zero to anything, you will get the same thing. So a plus zero is always a. And if you multiply something by one, you will again get the same thing. So one times a is always a. Of course, the order doesn't matter because we're commutative. And finally, we have inverses. So for every element A, I should have uh, an additive inverse. So I write it like this. Now I'm going to be more specific here. For every element A in F, there is another element, which I call it minus A, also in F, such that a plus minus a is zero. Oh, and this. Okay. And so minus a is just the additive inverse of a. And now I also need to have multiplicative inverses, but only if it's not zero. So for every element that is not zero, for every A that is in S, but not the zero elements. Uh, there is another element, which I call A inverse in F, such that A multiplied by A inverse is just one. Okay. Yeah, that's it. So this is 
what I mean whenever I talk about a field. Now, if you think about it, uh, you've definitely used a lot of fields already, right? So, for example, if you think about uh, real numbers with normal addition and multiplication and normal zero and one, they satisfy all of these constraints, right? Similarly, if you think about, uh, let's say, uh, rational numbers with the same operations on 0 and 1, they satisfy all of these constraints. But for example, if you look at natural numbers, they don't satisfy all of these things because uh, you don't have multiplicative inverses in natural numbers. If you have a natural number, for example, 2, you don't have another natural number that can be multiplied by it and gives you 1. But we are normally interested in finite fields. And finite fields are just fields where this number, and then where this set f is finite. And especially for any prime number p, I can have what we call fp, which is a field of size p. And it's basically that I'm taking all the numbers modulo p on the integers modulo p. And then my addition is just addition modulo p. My multiplication is just multiplication modulo p. My zero is just zero modulo p, which is like all the numbers that are divisible by p. And my one is just one modulo p. And you can see that if I have uh, a prime number p, all of these things work, right? So. Associativity, we have that anyway, because like A plus B mod P plus C mod P, it doesn't really matter in what order you do the addition when you're doing calculation modulo some number. And the same thing for multiplication. Of course, it's commutative, like the order doesn't matter. It's distributed, yeah. easy to see. We have identity, of course. So this one says that if I have some number A, and I add something to it that is a multiple of p, I get something that has the same remainder when divided by p. And also this one holds as well. Now, the nice part is the inverses. The additive inverse is quite easy. So for any number a, of course, you have minus a modulo p. Right? And so you have another number that you can add to A, and you will just get a number that is divisible by P. That's easy. But this last part, this is called uh, Fermat's little theorem, actually, that gives us the uh, inverses like that. So Fermat's little theorem says that uh, basically A to the power of P is congruent to A itself modulo P. And this holds for every number a, right? And then from this, for any non-zero a, I can say that a to the power of uh, okay for any non-zero a, a to the power of p minus one is also equal to one modulo p. This is another way of uh, saying the uh, Fermat's little theorem, but this only holds for a that are Answer, right? And yeah, basically, if a to the power of p minus one is one, then a to the power of p minus two is just the inverse of a, because you multiply it by a and you get one. So if you look at all the remainders of dividing numbers by p, and you just define these operations in a natural way, you also get the field. Okay, yeah, and the way we want to use them, use these things in the next session is that basically we want to do arithmetic, but instead of using real numbers, we're just going to use a field. And then normally we don't fix a field at the beginning of our algorithm, we just find a randomized algorithm using some field, and then at the end of it, we come back and say what field should we use so that our randomized algorithm works in FTP. That's the whole idea. Okay, I'll see you in the next session.